everybody. Um, hi, good morning. Um, welcome to New America. My name is Kevin Carey. I'm the Vice President for Education Policy here. Um, and I want to say both to all of you uh, in our offices in downtown Washington, D.C., and everyone who's watching online, we really appreciate you joining us for this discussion uh, this morning. You know, we uh, often plan events here ahead of time with a sense of optimism and positivity about the kinds of change that we are trying to see in the world. Um, this event's a little different. Um, we plan for it, hoping that we wouldn't have to have it, but we plan for it nonetheless. And so we find ourselves now in really the remarkable situation to be here in the year 2023 and find the, that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, um, which was created to begin the emancipation of black Americans, has now been weaponized against them, them and other people of color, um, by the United States Supreme Court. Um, a court whose membership is only as it is, uh, because when the United States Senate was given a nomination by America's first black president, um, it chose to nullify that nomination for the first time in America's history. Um, that's a hard set of circumstances to come together around. Um, but it makes it all the more important that we're here today having this conversation. Um, we have, I'm only gonna to speak to you for a few minutes uh, before um, turning it over to the people you've all come to listen to. We have both a group of esteemed scholars who have uh, worked long in their careers to understand and improve issues related to race and diversity in higher education. Um, and we have a group of students from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, one of the, the two plaintiffs uh, or the two, sorry, one of the two defendants in the Supreme Court case um, that happened last month, um, who have very generously taken some time to travel here to Washington, D.C. Um, to talk about their experiences as students um, and um, both what they uh, have come to experience and what their expectations are in the future. Um, in our broader message, that we hope to begin in this conversation today to all of America's policymakers here in Washington, D.C., um, to all of the administrators and students and people in higher education, is that um, despite the decision that the Supreme Court handed down, there are still many, many things that can be done to improve the quality of education that students receive, to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in our institutions of higher education. Um, and this is going to be a moment for a lot of administrators and leaders in colleges where they're going to have to decide, um, to some extent, whether they really are going to back up some of the words that they've been using about their commitments to these issues. It's harder now, um, but that doesn't mean there's no difference between the things they can do and the things they cannot. Um, there are a lot of important choices to make. Those choices will affect the quality of education that students receive in American higher education. They will affect the opportunities that people have to go on to higher learning, um, to meet with one another, to be educated, and to uh, contribute in all the ways that college graduates and scholars contribute to American society. Um, so we really see this as the beginning of a conversation and an effort here at, the New, at New America um, to catalyze these conversations, to bring people together. <clears throat> and it begins here with all of you. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming. Um, we have a great program, and I am now going to turn it over for introductions to Rachel Fishman, um, the director of our higher education program here at New America. Rachel. Thanks, Kevin, um, for that introduction and those remarks. It really is a, a call to action, and I'm so looking forward to the people that we've convened here today um, to discuss further. So for those who don't know me, I'm Rachel Fishman. I'm currently the acting director for the higher education program at New America, and I have 
the distinct honor of getting to introduce the first of two panels today. Um, our second panel features students from the University of North Carolina, like Kevin said, from the Affirmative Action Coalition. Um, and we're gonna learn more about them in a moment. But first, I'd like to introduce you to the scholars and, and advocates um, who are going to join me on stage. So our moderator today is Deshaun Carr. Um, Deshaun is a policy analyst with the higher education team at New America. Her work focuses on student basic needs issues uh, that promote student success and outcomes. She has been leading New America's listening tour on affirmative action for people who don't know the people who will be on this panel today. They were already interviewed um, by Deshaun in the lead up to this event. Um, and you can catch all that content on our blog, and some of them have authored some pieces that will be going up on our blog as well. Um, next, we have Maya Lubin. Uh, Maya is a higher education equity senior coordinator at the Lawyers' Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. At the committee, Maya leads the Reason Project. It's an initiative that brings civil rights activists, organizations, and students together to develop comprehensive strategies for increasing racial equity and advancing access to equal educational opportunity at flagship universities. Next, we have Dr. David Mikey Pablayo. Um, he's a postdoctoral fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and, Amer and African American Research at Harvard and the Civil Rights Project at the University of California, Los Angeles. His research focuses on issues of race in higher education, primarily on the disparate impact of states that have already banned race-conscious admissions practices. Um, David Hawkins is the Chief Education and Policy Officer for the National Association for College Admissions and Counseling. Uh, and for those of you who uh, live in DC, we love a good acronym. So his acronym is NACAC, uh, a nonprofit membership organization um, that represents more than 25,000 high school counselors and college admissions officers. For over 20 years now, David has worked in enrollment management and admissions to alleviate um, systemic barriers to accessing higher education. And last but not least is Ed Smith. He's a, policy, a senior policy advisor with Ed Council. Prior to Ed Council, he consulted at the New Jersey Office of the Secretary of Higher Education, and he's worked at the Kresge Foundation. Ed's work has been focused on, has focused on increasing college affordability, uh, modernizing student loan debt repayment, and recovering funds lost by students um, from for, who attended for-profit colleges. So welcome to this uh, esteemed panel. Thank you all for being here today, and I'm going to turn it over to Deshaun to get us started. Uh, thank you so much for the introductions again, Rachel, and also thank you for the opening remarks, Kevin. Um, and thank you to you all um, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join me on this stage and talk about the timely things that just happened a few weeks ago. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of our questions, I do want to do a temperature check. Um, now that we are a couple of weeks removed from the decision, I would love to hear from you all What's one word that summarizes your thoughts about the court decision on race conscious admissions? Anyone would like to go first? <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to kick it okay. off. Um, so as Kevin really eloquently laid out in his introduction, I think there's a grief um, that needs to be acknowledged, a grief. Um, and feeling sort of dropped by the highest court in the land. Um, the Lawyers Committee has the really distinct privilege and honor of representing students and alumni at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and at Harvard. My colleague David, who's also on the Educational Opportunities Project team at the Lawyers Committee, argued um, the case in front of the Supreme Court and represented those students and alumni. So particularly when talking to those folks, there's a real grief um, to to work through around the decision. But there's also hope, right? As we spoke about, um, affirmative action was, or race conscious admissions, was our government's attempt to act affirmatively to right um, decades of systemic wrongs. Um, however, there are more tools at our disposal to do that work. So there's a grief to be acknowledged, but there's also some hope as well. 
for me, it's motivated. Uh, I'm really motivated to continue to do the work that I do right now, uh, to do the scholarship that I do. Uh, it's going to take a, a lot of work, a lot of hard work, and it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, the Supreme Court's makeup isn't going to change anytime soon. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, we got to be uh, also creative in this moment as well. I would say probably the word that, that stands out to me is unjust. Um, this, is a, this is a court decision that seemed almost preordained in some ways. If you look at the majority opinion, uh, you see uh, facts and assertions that, that almost seem like they heard a case that was argued back in 1978. Whereas the dissenting justices seem to have paid attention, for instance, to things like the lower court rulings, uh, briefs that may have been filed by organizations like the ones that you see up here, and reflected very much a current state of play. So uh, a deeply unjust decision from the court. I believe that they had their mind made up well ahead of time. Uh, as we were fond of saying, they didn't, they didn't take this case to tread water. Um, so, uh, but as Dr. David says, uh, we are highly motivated. Um, and I think that's, that's the takeaway. I appreciate that uh, and uh, echo the comments made by my co-panelists wholeheartedly. Uh, I too am hopeful and motivated, but uh, the word I uh, sit with is hypocrisy. Um, I, I think for a few reasons, I, uh, Kevin mentioned the weaponization of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, which I think reeks of hypocrisy and I you know, said so eloquently earlier on. Um, but also the military carve out, the intellectual dishonesty uh, uh, throughout the majority opinion, um, the through line of color blindness uh, in the face of America's legacy of racial oppression, um, the current racialized disparities in educational, economic, uh, health, s social outcomes, uh, the experiences that uh, minoritized racial, racial and ethnic uh, people have um, with our social institutions. I think. Uh, the ruling spits in the face of that, and for that reason, I'm continuing to wrestle with the hypocrisy of it. Yeah, thank you all for sharing those those words. And <clears throat> ooh, excuse me, um, yeah, hypocrisy, motivator, um, creative. I feel like those are all the words that we're gonna have to, you know, thinking about this decision and going forward. I kind of want to now get into the nitty, the real nitty gritty of our questions now, and I'm coming to you, Ed. Um, so even before SCOTUS decided on affirmative action, we start to see racial equity come under attack, um, with some lawmakers already banning diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, uh, initiatives, um, and particularly Southern Republican states. Um, and recently, some states have announced wanting to eliminate scholarships that consider race, even though the course decision didn't extend the scholarships and financial aid. How can federal policymakers ensure students of color can access scholarships and resources to pay for college? No, I appreciate that. And for sure, we, at Ed Council, we are seeing a, a wave of what we're calling anti-equity, anti-DEI uh, policies at the state level uprooting the, you know, our nation's progress toward diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher ed, um, which deeply saddens me, but also uh, motivates me for work ahead. This legal ruling, we believe, will um, add some political fuel to that movement, um, which is even more unfortunate. Uh, I know we'll talk about long-term policy solutions and maybe approaches the feds can take, but um, in the immediate term, I, I would like to just bring up the notion of enforcement. Um, and as much as I would uh, love for the White House or the Department of Ed or OCR um, to delay enforcement of the court's rulings, uh, which may be one policy measure we could consider, um, I think it would be worthwhile to consider the ways that Title IV funding um, could be used as a carrot, perhaps stick, uh, to prevent states and college leaders from overreaching, uh, uh, from making the legal decision uh, propel the ongoing political movement to uproot diversity, equity, and inclusion. What do I, what do I mean by that? Well, I, like you mentioned, in states of Missouri, Wisconsin, Kentucky, institutions in Illinois, and there are probably many more at this point, we've seen lawmakers, higher ed, leaders um, 
apply a, a ban on race consciousness to financial aid and other areas of higher ed administration, particularly those that serve students. Um, so, uh, you know, for, uh, in whatever guidance that comes out and whatever, you know, iterations of the fact sheets that I, I believe the White House has uh, put forth that I am supportive of, I would love to see maybe measures to protect uh, uh, financial aid programs that might be race conscious or uh, grounded in the historical realities that uh, we see with respect to wealth disparities, income disparities, and the uh, dis differences in resources that students have as they approach and navigate the college choice process. I'll just say one last thing. Um, in the spirit of uh, being you know, rooted in the human experience and dignified, I'd resist strategies that place even more burden on students, even more cognitive load, even more uh, emotional load to tell their stories uh, with plight and in, grounded in discrimination. I think when we do that, um, we suggest that they are only their plight, only the discrimination they faced. Uh, I look forward to hearing from the students and emerging scholars on the subsequent panel. But um, when we use words like resiliency, grit, adversity, uh, out of context and you know, make sure that, you know, and suggest that we should focus on those things, let's say in the essay questions or in the applications process, um, then we are suggesting that they should be doing more work to achieve our nation's diversity and equity goals. I think it's a shared responsibility and I'd like to see the feds and institutions share in that responsibility and not just transfer it over to students. Would anyone else like to follow up or comment on that question as well too? There's, uh, oh, I want to say uh, really quickly, there's, uh, there's a, a, a colleague of mine, she's a, a PhD student at uh, the University of Michigan right now. Her name's uh, Aya waller Bay, and she's doing a lot of research on precisely that topic of personal essays and surveys. And uh, what, what the Supreme Court has, has done with their ruling is to still allow uh, the personal essay to in some way take race into account. But what researchers are saying that it's precisely going to come down to just students writing about their trauma narratives and personal essays, and you know that's we're doing a terrible thing in this country to students of, of of color by making them write about that trauma, that their their plight experience in a personal essay, and, and saying like, okay, if you want access to a highly selective institution, like you have to tell everyone how, how hard you've had it in life, how, much, how hard you've had to suffer. Like people don't want to talk about those experiences a lot of times. Uh, it, and that's, that's a horrible thing that students are gonna have to do now. Um, it is, it's re-traumatizing when you're writing an essay, you're re the student is re-traumatizing themselves just to hope that they're going to get into this university um, on this one essay. Did you want to? Well, I, I do think for uh, students who are watching who may be applying, um, this case wasn't about if you are a minority student uh, because of uh, whatever uh, presumed hardships you can get in over somebody else. That's not what this, is, what this was about. This was about being able to be considered in the fullness of your identity, um, even if it is tied to your racial identity. And so um, we should not put that burden on, on students to discuss harmful, traumatic experiences um, that have to do with race. However, if students would still like to discuss the beautiful pieces of their identity that have to do with their racial identity, they certainly can still do so. Um, the, there was a piece about students can talk about their hardship or inspiration, right? And there was a particular line um, where students can still discuss the fullness of their identity, but not go through sort of the, uh, what is it, oppression Olymp Olympics, yeah. Yeah, thank you all for commenting um, on that. Kind of want to keep the conversation focused a little bit on the institution. So. David Hawkins, <laughs> um, I know um, you've worked a lot uh, with institutions to reform their admission process with a racial equity lens. And when I chatted with you on the New America's Affirmative Action Listening Tour series, you mentioned racial equity uh, change cannot solely focus on a mission process, but needs to happen within the entire institution. What does that look like? And how can we hold institutions accountable for that? 
Uh, excellent question. And we issued a report last year, we being NACAC, um, in which we made the observation, which many people have made, um, that admissions as it's practiced at a lot of institutions in this country right now is very much like the admission processes that were created originally around the turn of the 20th century, so eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. And while admission practices have evolved in some ways, in important ways, during the last century or so, that basic admission process is still in place. You know, of course, the high school experience is always going to be one of the most important things colleges are going to look at. But you start going down the line and you see standardized tests, you see interviews, you see essays, you see letters of recommendation. All those things harken back to a time when colleges were really trying to figure out who to, who to keep out, not who to let in. And the fact that so many institutions have now sort of replicated that, created that system that, that really is, in, is, is amazingly static from year to year, is something we really need to look at. We really need to, uh, in this report that we, that we issued, we said if we're serious about equity, uh, we have to probably change the system that we use for admission. We have to change the way we think about admission to post-secondary education. Uh, because so many of the things we do now sort of tilt the scale towards inequity because they are based on a fundamentally inequitable system. So within, and there are a lot of recommendations which the report outlines that I won't, I won't drone on about today, but the bottom line to your point, uh, Deshaun, about the, the institution. Uh, admission offices, despite the fact that they seem to be all powerful at some points, are really not. They do certainly have agency. They are important actors. They can advocate and lead in many very important ways. But there is a, an administration that they report to, presidents, boards of trustees, state legislatures. There are faculty that have very strong and often uninformed opinions about college admission. Um, there are alumni. There are all sorts of different areas of the institution that play into the conversation. And one of our goals in the, in the future, and one of the things we're actually quite excited about, is to have the conversations around the institution about re reforming admissions, literally reforming. Uh, and that, I think, is going to uh, require us to uh, to step out of our day-to-day -day work as institutions and talk strategically about how things need to change, start getting offices to talk to each other. Uh, we found that the, often the diversity offices on campus don't have a real strong relationship with the admissions office, which that has to change. So there are many different conversations that we'd like to ignite um, and start to talk about different ways to even think about admissions. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And yeah, that reforming process cannot necessarily just happen in admissions, and it can't just happen overnight, too. Like, racial equity is not an overnight process. It's definitely a day-to-day, -day, or what some people say is a marathon. It's, it's something that continues to go. Um, speaking on racial equity, I want to talk a little bit more with you, Maya, about student voice and representation around affirmative action. Um, I know your work has been focus on working with students directly on their campus, advocating with them, uh, thinking about their basic needs. Um, with the court's decision, it seems like now more than ever, um, it's important for policymakers, whether it be institutional, state, federal, to bring students to the table when creating policies that embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are some successes you've seen in your work helping students to organize? And what recommendations do you have for policymakers who want to incorporate student voice or perhaps have blind spots when it comes to working with students in these spaces. Absolutely. So higher ed policy and governance can sort of seem like a black box, right? Um, nobody knows what goes in and, and exactly how we get its outputs. Um, but at its healthiest, this idea of shared governance being at the system, uh, at the center with students as part of that stakeholder group in, when it comes to shared governance, um, it creates more robust policy making. So uh, much like the conversation we just had, um, equity should be seen as sort of this continuous service circle, right? It doesn't just matter how and where we recruit. It matters the experiences that students are having while they're on campus, if there's equitable access to an opportunity culture on campus, and the list goes on and on and on. And it's sort of this circular motion. And um, 
our biggest experts there are students. They live in the gap between the policy making that happens in the conference room or the Zoom room, right, and the outcome metrics that we look at, look at afterward. And so they truly are um, experts on the in-between. They color in the lines that maybe our regression model can't show us as well with as much nuance, right? We still need those regression models, but um, adding that student voice is, is important. Um, and so, Adding the, so to policymakers who are unsure about it, um, including student voice, I would say first to think about how you are um, conceptually coming to this conversation um, and rethink um, what you think students have to bring to bear to the conversation substantively. Um, and, and from there, if you're unsure how to engage students in the process, reach out to some folks who do, right? There are um, a number uh, of student-led and student-centered organizations that can support that work, like a national organization, like a Young Invincibles or someone like that, or state-level organizations like an Ohio Student Association, for example, and then um, campus-level student organizations like the UNC Affirmative Action Coalition. And New America is being a really great um, example in that today, right? You don't have necessarily student chapters, but to have this important conversation, you went and grabbed some student voice to be a part of it. Um, so I think there are many ways that, that we should do that, but we have to remember that they are experts and have substantive um, perspective to bring to bear in policy conversations. Yeah, just want to reiterate, they are the experts when it comes to all this work. Um, and we as policymakers or not, or as in lines of our work, we owe it to them to make sure that we are committed to, you know, doing the things that we need to do for them, um, all to say. Um, got one more time for one more question coming to you, Dr. David. Um, your research has examined the ramifications of states that have banned race conscious emissions. Um, I know me and you, we chatted a lot about the disparate impact and all those things, but what can we learn from the states who have already banned? I know you've done work in California and also you were a student um, at Michigan State when all this was going on. So you have the lived experience and then you also done the research as well. Yeah, um, I think that the biggest piece that's missing right now from the national conversation about what to do in response to the current bans is taking the example of the current bands that we have and seeing how they impacted the entire system of post-secondary education. And one of the uh, discoveries that I made in one of my uh, forthcoming uh, research articles is that um, you can take a look at for-profit colleges and universities and see that there was an increase in underrepresented minority student enrollment at those schools. So it's not only the, the fact that underrepresented minority students are kind of being displaced from the most selective ones, they're being kind of funneled all the way down into uh, much lower quality institutions that oftentimes have lawsuits against them for weird and bogus recruitment practices. So I think one of the federal uh, policy recommendations that, that I would say we need to make is to bolster down on the gainful employment rule, which is something that focuses on for-profit colleges and universities. And uh, what the gainful employment rule does is it makes for-profit colleges and universities more accountable to their students, making sure that they're able to pay back all the money that they borrowed for college upon graduating. So that's that's a good outcome. That's a non-race focused policy recommendation, which can be done now. And it will not only help students of color, which are, in my, in my opinion, what my research says is gonna happen is that we're gonna have a lot more students of color at, at these types of institutions. And, um, you know, this is gonna be this will be a good response if, if, if we can get out ahead of it and know that the students are likely to end up at these types of schools. I do have a follow-up to that question. <clears throat> it's not related to for-profits, but a little bit more around HBCUs and MSIs. Because I know there's been also recent uh, things to come out that a lot of them are preparing themselves to see an influx of applications. What are your thoughts on you know preparing and supporting, I guess, these other institutions who are also going to be I guess, attracting more students at HBCUs and MSIs, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that as well, too. I think, I think this is uh, 
this is also a place that, that exists where we can continue to support these types of institutions. Students are going to end up enrolling in these types of institutions uh, at a greater clip now. Um, we just have to make sure that we can get uh, people in, in the government behind behind issues uh, and, and, and give them give them funding, give them what they need to be successful. Yeah. Uh, help them increase their their enrollment numbers. These are still uh, many times um, somewhat selective schools. Um, so anything that can be done to help them expand their enrollment capacities would be really, really helpful. Any, any other follow-up questions or follow-ups to that question? Just that we shouldn't wait until, you know, a Supreme Court affirmative action <laughs> ruling to support HBCUs and, and MSIs because we think there's going to be an influx. Mm -hmm. Those are institutions who, are, who earned support um, on their own merit without, you know, these extra pieces. So I just wanted to say that out loud, that oh, they deserve yeah. their, they their deserve just that. due, no matter a Supreme Court ruling. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. I do have time for one more question, and this is for anyone who wants to answer. Um, and we kind of touched a little bit on this already about when it comes to racial equity at the institution level. But kind of this, these court cases have brought up the, the issue of being uncomfortable when it comes to talking about race and racism. What is it going to take for institutions and policymakers to have these uncomfortable conversations about race and racism so that we can actually move the needle in achieving racial equity? And that is open to any one of you that, I know it's a lot, but it's open to anyone that would love to answer that. I don't know what, what it will take, but I, I think it would be helpful to resurface those statements from the summer of 2020 um, and take stock of what progress we've achieved, you know, whether by institution or state, um, in implementing the ideas therein when we were considering this kind of reckoning of our racial history and our, the higher ed systems and colleges' complicity in uh, the racial oppression of, of black and brown folks and indigenous folks in, in, in America, right? I think beyond that, there's a moral responsibility. And if that if the statements don't compel folks to talk about uncomfortable issues of race and racism. Um, higher ed has, you know, and there are authors here that have written about this, benefited from racial oppression by way of uh, stolen lands and plunder that built the land grant system or uh, enslaved labor to, to build many colleges or propel it, the, the enterprise of higher education. Um, you know, we are a part of that. If we study it, if we're adjacent to the system in many ways, if we're an intermediary supporting students, we, we are a part of that. And I would hope that, you know, beyond what the business community can do to put pressure on colleges to, to maintain diversity by way of articulating that they need a diverse workforce or um, it's a part of our democracy or the social fabric of America, we could go on and on. Uh, pursuing other routes, but we do have a moral responsibility, I would argue, and uh, I would say responsibility is key here, um, and a commitment uh, must be made moving forward to maintain diversity and equity. Yeah. I think the first step is on all of us watching and in the room um, to not let these anti-equal opportunity actors go further with this ruling than they earned. This ruling was about admissions. It did not outlaw DEI programs. Um, it is not fuel for you to push an anti, you know, whatever CRT book ban <laughs> in your state legislature. It, it did none of those things. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for all of us to speak really loudly um, about what the ruling did do and what the ruling did not do. And to give the universities a little bit of cushion, per se, um, to be able to push back on some of these, uh, these onslaughts of attacks that they've received um, so I think that's the first step, um, not letting other folks go too far with the ruling. I, I, would, I would just add, you know, that, that higher education institutions can play a very important role in helping to shape our national narrative. Um, we are seeing right now a, a, an incredible uh, sort of effort to, to bend, some people bend themselves in, uh, into pretzels to try to justify a system uh, that if you simply admitted the truth about it, if you simply confronted some of the hard truths uh, about how our system is constructed, you wouldn't have to twist yourself in knots anymore to preserve what is. And, and, the, and the reality is that education, 
of any type can help everyone. There, there's so much room in education um, for us to do good and for institutions to, to model what diversity, equity, and inclusion can do and the kinds of amazing outcomes it can produce is, is, is a very important part of the future. Well, I would like to open the floor for Q&A now. And for those who are online, you may also submit a question and we'll be happy to take those as well. We have one right there in the back. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Question for Maya, I think particularly your last point about not letting this go any further. I, my background is financial aid. I'm already seeing colleges start to retract admissions that are based around racial and ethnic um, sort of groupings and characteristics. And I'm curious what your take is on that, because to me, with a background of financial aid, doesn't seem like these two things, admissions and financial aid are not synonymous, but I'm wondering what you think of some of the colleges that have already started to lump financial aid in with falling under this decision. Yeah, this is tricky. And I'll start by saying that there are a number of folks like the Lawyers Committee and the Legal Defense and Education Fund, and the list goes on, who are uh, preparing a number of reports to um, kind of spell out s some of these issues and, and what is still lawful and what's not. Um, you know, I, I hesitate to sit here and say, keep every single scholarship program. You know, I don't want to rush and push institutions into um, the murky waters of, of, of lawsuits. However, um, this is not free range to knock every program that, um, that creates more equal opportunity, right? And so this is where it'd be easier if um, the, the court just outlawed, you know, equity and inclusion in higher ed or, or, or but we had a, a ruling in between. And so it's going to take a more nuanced look. It's going to take, um, it's going to take us looking deeply and closely at what can be um, kept and what can't. But here's also the thing. The idea that admissions offices and DEI offices and small, not funded committees and colleges should shoulder the entire weight of the institutional equity um, mandate is, is bogus and, and won't work in the end, right? There, there's going to be a need for comprehensive measures. And so um, just mo going back to the conversation of making sure that equity is infused in each part of our institution. Um, and to not get rid of all of those scholarships just yet. Uh, reach out to some folks, some civil rights organizations, legal organizations who can help you analyze your particular scholarships in your area um, and, and how to make sure those target communities that most need them. Um, so my, I guess that's, that's about as clear as mud, right? But, but the answer is I want to protect you and not say keep, every, keep everything. But I do want to say um, reach out for help and support um, and, and to take a closer look. And don't be too quick to let go of every Thing that that um, creates more equal opportunity. Hi, this question is um, from one of our online viewers, Crystal. But she wanted to know, since universities can't really consider race with the intent to have a racially diverse student body, how can universities still strive for diversity in place? of race? This is really like the biggest question there is out there right now and what institutions are trying to navigate moving forward. And we heard a little bit about the personal essay, but would love to hear more what others are thinking. Maybe I'll take the first shot at this since our members are admission officers. Um, two, two broad answers. Um, number one, uh, we have the existing tools um, that everybody sort of knows about, the essays, the recommendations, the extracurriculars, those kinds of things. There is still plenty of room in, those, in all of those areas for someone to say, you know, to, to relate a life experience, uh, to say I was the head of the Latino student organization at my school, to, you know, what have you, for a teacher to, or, or a counselor to come out and say this student was active in X, Y, or Z uh, that can be indicative or outright uh, sort of plainly stating uh, a student's race or ethnicity. Um, so there's, there's one set of tools that are already at our disposal that we can use. The, the key, of course, is that the court, said, the court said nothing prohibits a college from looking at that so long as the consideration is not in the race itself, but in the character, the whatever personal trait is attractive to the college. So there's, there's going to be some, uh, some analysis that, that institutions clearly have to do there. We're also looking to the future, though. Um, and what we're looking at is that 
students do a lot in their K-12 educational experience that just kind of gets frittered away in the admissions process. Uh, we're looking at innovations like performance assessments and more robust narratives about what a student actually does in school uh, that can give you more than just a letter grade. It can tell you whether a student was, uh, worked well in groups, that they were innovative, that they were highly artistic, that they approached things different ways. And I think uh, we're even looking at ways in which admissions officers can actually look at artifacts that, that students have produced, videos of presentations, you know, science projects, things like that. Um, we, are, we would like to see a future where admissions knows a lot more about a, what, a, what a student has done in their school, uh, what context that school is in, and, and, and where that student comes from. So we hope there are going to be many different ways that we can gather that kind of important contextual information. One more, picked one more question. But even with that question, what's interesting is the court didn't strike you know, diversity on campus as, as it not being a compelling interest. So anyway, just something to also think about. No, something to definitely think about. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to say thank you for coming in today. This was um, super enjoyable so far. Um, this question's for Ed. So you mentioned the word hypocrisy um, as your one word that would describe um, what's going on or your um, feelings right now. Um, and obviously I, I think that's part of that's referring to this military loophole that um, was in the decision. Um, and I was just kind of wondering a little, if you could expand a little more on your thoughts behind uh, the existence of this loophole and um, if you were surprised. I think in the interest of time, I, I'll just share that I believe that uh, a diverse, equitable, um, inclusive higher ed system is of national interest as well, security and otherwise. Um, as much as our defense interests might be. And I think um, as someone who has, I've been recruited by colleges to play sports, um, but not as much as I've been recruited by the military to go out and fight on the front lines. I matriculated from high school during the Iraq war and there would be military officers to come to my part-time job to, uh, call my father's home line at 9, 10, 10 p.m. Um, we should be pursuing uh, people who look like me and perhaps others on this panel as vigorously to participate in the full array of opportunities that our incredible higher education system provides. Um, and when we suggest that that's of, not of national interest in security, defense, or otherwise, um, I think that's a hypocritical. We have one more question. Let's take the last one. Hi. Oh, it is on. Um, good afternoon. I wanted to ask, you know, in a lot of policy spaces, uh, what I gather in my experience is that we have trouble connecting with or meeting, you know, voters, constituents, where they're at with these conversations, with the messaging. So, you know, all of us in this room, might know what we're talking about, but how do we make sure that those of us who are learning about this issue are relaying a message that is relatable and connected to voters or constituents? That way, when they're having their conversations with people, they, they, it's in a way that's relatable, if that makes sense. That's a good question. Well, you know, I'll just build really quickly off of yeah. what I said about higher ed. I, I think the, 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 the phrase that comes to mind is that equity matters, and equity matters for everyone. And both, both in the sense that we all benefit from having an equitable system, but also that everybody out there may have ways in which they don't have equitable access to something. And I think that's what we need to, be, to, to do a better job of. Anyone else want to follow up to that question? Yeah, I, I think I think sometimes the 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 problem with with the voters and in, in the general public is that they don't they're not really familiar with the uh, the benefits of diversity arguments that existed out there and that were really brought into uh, play and played a central role in the uh, the early two thousand Supreme Court cases uh, the the Bollinger. University of Michigan cases, and 
And during that time, a lot of research was done saying that diversity is not only beneficial to uh, blacks and Latinos, but it's also a benefit to, to uh, whites and Asians. And I think when more people come to understand that part of the discussion, that part of the larger uh, discussion about affirmative action, and they start to recognize that, oh, yeah, there, there are benefits, and I could benefit in this way too, then I think people's mind about affirmative action really starts to change. But without that understanding, uh, you know, we see the polls the way that they are. Well, that concludes this first panel. I want to say thank you to you all for joining me in this intense dialogue. And hopefully, for the people who are watching and also people in the crowd, take away that um, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, even if the, the court decided not to have not overturned it, it's still a lot of things that need to be fixed and a lot of inequities that show um, within our system. But I do want to now transition over to our next panel, which would be um, with the UNC students. Thank you to the experts that were just that just joined me on the stage. Um, I can't thank you all enough for um, having that discussion with me. Um, I do want to transition to our next panel. So uh, the next want to transition over to um, you'll hear from students um, who are advocating in support of affirmative action and fighting to ensure incoming students of color feel welcomed and safe on their campus. But first, I want to introduce my colleague, Olivia Shickey, uh, who will be moderating this discussion. Olivia is a program associate at New America on our higher education team. Her work has included exploring faculty diversity on college campuses, and she also has collaborated with me on a few of the affirmative action listening tour series. Um, she is also doing some work around varying degrees, which is also a, an annual survey that actually surveys uh, Americans about their educational opportunities. Um, and now I want to enter, formally introduce um, our student panelists, um, Sarah Zong, uh, Christina Hong, Adela Zong, and Joy Zong, um, from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill's Affirmative Action Coalition. The coalition has been actively advocating and informing UNC students across the campus about the importance of diversity um, and the role affirmative action plays in ensuring that underrepresented students um, have opportunities to pursue higher education. I don't want to say too much because they will get into a conversation and have the opportunity uh, to tell you more about themselves. Thank you to Sean for that introduction and thank you all so much for making your way out to DC and speaking with us today. It was an absolute joy getting to talk to you the first time on our listening tour and as we are navigating this grief and this recent, these recent decisions, I think it is so important that we are amplifying your voices and the work you are doing as well. So to kind of get started, um, first I want to start this conversation just by learning more about all of you and your organization. So if each of you could share what year you're in, what your major is, and whoever wants to take this last part, what was the turning point for your campus meeting and organization like UNC's Affirmative Action Coalition? I guess I can start us off. Um, hi everyone, my name is Adela. I am studying business and computer science at UNC and I am class of 2025. I can pick it up. My name is Joy and I'm also a class of 2025. My uh, major is medical anthropology, political science, and I'm minoring in PPE, which is short for uh, philosophy, politics, and economics at UNC. Hi everyone, I'm Christina. Um, I am the class of 2026, and I'm studying political science and information science. And I'll take the last part, um, but first, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm also class of 2025, studying computer science and political science with a minor in data science. And I originally founded the Affirmative Action Coalition back in September 2022, so a month before the Supreme Court hearing. And the reason behind it was I came to UNC from Pennsylvania, so I was an out-of-state student, and UNC is an in-state school. So about 80% of the student population there comes from North Carolina. So I came there, and I had just never heard about the affirmative action case. And I proceeded to not 
know about it up until the very beginning of my sophomore year. And when I first heard about it, I was like, why is no one talking about this? This is not only going to dramatically change the landscape of the student body here at Carolina, but it's going to impact public universities across the country. So that's why the four of us convened um, within a month and worked to educate as many Tar Heels as we could about what the case was. And there were just so many students that we talked to that had never heard of affirmative action before. They had no idea that there was a Supreme Court case going on. They just didn't really understand the implication that this lack of diversity could have on our students. And that was very much a point for us to convene and just talk to students about their opinions. So yeah, that's a little bit of background. Thank you so much for sharing. Does anybody have anything they want to add? Okay, so thank you so much for that. Um, and clearly, as is evident, um, the work y'all are doing is so important because, like you said, not everybody even knew this was happening. But now that the decision has been made, um, a significant part of your work previously has focused on initiating these discussions among students about the importance of affir affirmative action. But now that um, it has been overturned, what does activism look like um, moving forward for you all? So I can take this question. Uh, like Sarah mentioned, we initially started as like a per, like um, a organization to educate and inform students on campus. Uh, lots of my friends, when I mentioned this uh, when it first came out, was like they didn't know that that was a case. They didn't know that it started in 2014. They didn't know anything. They didn't hear about the student interveners. And so we wanted to emphasize on how important it was. And so that's what the initial like the um, initial like motivation was to start this organization but um now we like kind of shifted to like talk about everything related to diversity at unc and it's not just affirmative action based um because we just really want to emphasize the importance of diversity and how it can help us socially grow and it benefits all students no matter um, if you're a student of color or not and so that's like one of the biggest things that we've been um focusing on and a lot of like another thing that uh, me and Christina recently found out or not recently, but this was back in like the fall. Um, we were going through like some of the archives at UNC and one of the biggest things was like UNC's like progression to becoming more diverse has been um, always been student led. And so we want to continue working and um, kind of what we've been doing is like trying to expand on our campus by uh, unifying all of our like uh, cultural clubs and like trying to like get other people to speak up and I think um, it's evident that we have uh, considering like our responses when the case first dropped we released a response within I believe the hour it fell and or the decision came out and then a lot of like our fellow student orgs also like kind of based some of their responses onto ours and I think we've just been trying to unify our campus and highlight the importance of diversity. Very cool. And that work is so important because all of these topics around diversity, equity, and inclusion on college campuses, they're all so important. And you spoke about how um, a lot of the diversification on UNC's campus has been student-led. Um, but we also know that faculty can play a role in um, supporting students. And this will be especially important now that we are looking for new and innovative ways to support students of color. So something I'm particularly interested in, um, in our affirmative action listening to our talk, some of you mentioned this role that faculty of color in particular play in ensuring that students of color have a safe space on campus. And so I was just wondering, um, what connections do you see between the federal affirmative action ban and the importance of having a diverse faculty? Yeah, I can take this question. I think something that we keep repeating is that affirmative action isn't a silver bullet. It's not, it doesn't solve all issues. There are a lot of things that also play into creating a safe environment and a diverse um, environment on campus. And one of the, those things are um, having diverse city and faculty. And um, I think what we're seeing across the country is a lot of bans on DEI, which are also having at UNC, where they're banning uh, GI statements. And um, our medical school actually was supposed to have a whole program dedicated to um, doing DEI work and they repealed that because of our state legislator. Um, and so students find so much um, mentorship in their faculty. So um, they take up a lot of, I think being an academic is work around the clock, but it's also when you are a 
faculty of color on campus, you do a lot of other work that is put on to you because you are a person of color. Specifically, I've noticed a lot of women of color take on this responsibility. And at UNC, they have a really difficult time recruiting and retaining faculty of color because of the amount of work that is put onto them. And we've had a huge um, amount of faculty leave because they said that you know we're not being compensated. Um, they're so much of their time is kind of doing damage control and not actually their academic work. And they're seen as, oh, tokenized, as this is their work, just helping students, um, helping students get over, process their racial trauma and continue to process the trauma they face on campus. And they're only known as the, the professor of color on campus as opposed to their academic work. Um, and so um, an example of this work was, um, we had a professor, Dr. William Starkey, Sturkey, who was on campus, and when we had the Silent Sam monument taken down, he was the one who, out of his own time, and he wasn't being compensated because UNC said that they wouldn't compensate him, he taught classes about what was happening, the history um, in, on UNC campus, and um, it was his la second last class, I think, or the last class where they found out that UNC gave $2.5 million to a neoconservative group. And that was a very big disappointment for, for him because he was doing so much work supporting um, students of color, specifically black students on campus, and educating. And he wasn't compensated, but they did have the money to donate that to um, a neoconservative group. And so we keep seeing teachers and um, professors um, leave campus. And we had a professor speak out, uh, Dr. Cal Cal Caldwell. And she said, I was one of the one of eight black full-time professors, black women full-time professors on this campus. And you can imagine, on a campus of 30,000 students, how much you have to take on. So I think now we're repealing not only affirmative action, we're repealing um, a more DEI. Then it's like these institutions, when you're the only person of color, um, it gets, it's a lot of to take on, and it's a lot of a burden. Yes, we definitely have a lot of work to do in ensuring that not only that we have um, diverse faculty that's so that students feel supported, but also that we are protecting these diverse faculty as well. And you bring up the DEI bans, and that actually serves as a perfect segue into our next question. Um, so for whoever wants to take it, um, across many conservative-leaning states, these bills are being introduced to ban campus-based programming that embraces diversity and equity diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so what are your thoughts on these bills emerging out of state legislatures, and what should Congress and the White House in particular know about DEI initiatives and their role in post-secondary success for students of color? Yeah, I kind of want to, I think we have kind of categorized this anti-DEI movement as the quote-unquote Florida effect because so much has originated in Florida, like for instance, the Don't Say Gay Bill, which is probably the most prominent example. And UNC is a public state school, which means that our board of trustees is controlled by the state legislature. So obviously when we have a conservative state legislature, we have a conservative board of trustees that is more willing to crack down on DEI policies. So this has been really, really frustrating for us because there are movements on campus that say that conservative thought is being oppressed and they want to create pathways um, for, for more conservative speakers to come onto campus. And that's just extremely dangerous to us, as well as Christina was saying, the lack of diverse faculty we already have, that's huge. And it's really, really frustrating to see um, I'm currently interning on the Hill, and I went to a briefing last week that was held by the One Million Teachers of Color campaign, and they shared a statistic that in 96% of schools, the ratio of students of color is, significant, is higher than the ratio of teachers of color. That is huge. And I know I grew up not having not having any teachers of color in a predominantly white community, and that really kind of shaped my path to activism. So I think it's really hard to ask federal policymakers to do a lot about this because so much of education is state controlled. But one of the biggest things we can do is pass legislation such as, such as the Payer Teachers Act, which will raise the minimum wage of teachers up to 60K. Finan financial barriers are such a huge blockage of achieving um, having teachers of color. And then also, 
more, uh, more publication of education data and the current committee on education in the workforce has been banning um, a lot of the usage of education data and when we don't have access to data, we don't have access to statistics and student stories that help shape policy. So those are just two of the things that um, federal policymakers can do, but I think a lot of this battle will be concentrated at the state legislature and students should be paying more attention to that as well. Thank you so much for sharing. Do any of, does anybody else have anything to add? Sounds good. Okay, so for our next question, um, we are seeing more student advocates like yourselves emerge in the wake of affirmative action being overturned and as more states try to ban DEI efforts. Um, so what would you like to say to other students at other college campuses fighting for equal opportunity and for their identities to be embraced throughout higher education? Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, um, you are not alone. Uh, there's a community behind you. There are organizations like New America and the Lawyers Committee that are supporting you and supporting all of the work that you are doing and fighting and advocating for yourself and other people. Um, that having been said, uh, it is also not anyone's responsibility or any student's responsibility to represent your entire school when it comes to diversity and affirmative action. I think Sarah actually mentioned that this morning. Um, I think it can be very exhausting and when we were having discussions with other students of color at our school, they all mentioned that it was very mentally exhausting having to feel like they're advocating for not only themselves but other students of color and then also even students beyond their own cultural identity because again, diversity and affirmative action affects everyone. Um, so I think it's also very easy to feel like you're alone and then it's also very easy to feel like you have imposter syndrome and that you don't belong, especially when there's other opinions actively trying to tell you that you don't deserve this spot on campus when you obviously earned it, you are there for a reason. So just reminding yourself as well that um, it is just imposter syndrome and that you really do have a spot and that you are there for a reason. And to quickly add on to that, um, yes, the case uh, was UNC, and yes, the case was Harvard, but this is not a Harvard or a UNC fight alone. This is a, like a nationwide fight, and as many voices or as many people who want to get involved, we will continuously support them as they have probably continuously supported us. And so um, I think what we had something asked, well, someone asked a similar question to us, um, and one thing I just said was having a conversation and just sparking that initial like light is so important on a campus that doesn't have any of it. And Sarah being the one to do that, UNC um, joined the four of us, and yeah, and we're trying to be as progressive as we can with this. <laughs> Yes, the work y'all are doing is absolutely amazing. Um, so kind of to tie into that or add on to that, um, that mental exhaust, um, it's not just with the advocates, it's with students of color across campuses, across the nation. Um, so many students of color are feeling discouraged and uncertain about their post-secondary future now that affirmative action has been overturned. So kind of to add on, what message do you have for those students who seek hope in this situation? And what message do you have for policymakers as well? Um, I can start us off. Okay. okay. Um, so first, we will not give up. And that's something that we want to make very clear to everyone who's listening and anyone who has time to listen to us. Um, we are not going to give up. And there's so many things that we can do. And there's so many ways. Because uh, just because they overturned affirmative action, like Christina said, it's not a silver bullet. There are so many different things that we're going to try and do. There's so many ways that we want to uplift student voices um, and everything like that. Um, to, for everything in our power to like make the university to continue to be diverse, um, even with everything that's going against us. And my co-chair, because uh, I'm the outreach chair, um, and my co-chair, Julian, I think you spoke to him. Um, he I had a quote from him, because I just, I love him so much. But um, he said, numbers don't define students, and affirmative action has never been about prioritizing people who don't deserve it. It has been about improving access for people who do. And that's truly, like, like the most beautifully well well rounded well said thing that um, I've heard, and it's that's what it is. It's not about the number. Like we're not breaking it down to uh, twenty percent of this amount of students and um, other things like that. So we want to we want us to continue to strive forward and be as um, equitable with all of our opportunities. 
And just to add on to that, that was a really good quote when I listened to it. I was like, that's so, like embodies everything we're fighting for. Um, I've, the last month, had the privilege of um, kind of sitting down and speaking with a lot of previous student uh, protesters and listening to the, and researching their backgrounds. And it's amazing to hear what previous generations have done. Um, some of these students have gone on hunger strikes for like for uh, weeks and they've uh, stormed buildings. They did all these things to push for ethnic studies um, and other um, like war protests. And I think just seeing the, the community that they have built um, and hearing from them how they are so, like, they continue, they're, they're defiant and they continue to fight for what they know is right, for equity. Um, and it reminds me of Derek Bell's um, interest convergence theory where it's like, in order to, um, the majority, to get the majority to move, the minority's um, interest has to converge with the minority's interest. And I, and I want to say that like, just because we are the minority doesn't mean our needs are, doesn't diminish the importance of our needs. Like we know that we belong, and just because we were a smaller uh, portion of campus doesn't mean our voices don't matter. And so I think that's something I struggle a lot in high school. It's like I'm one student. What does it mean for me to be saying something? But it does matter because every voice matters and every voice counts. And you're, just, as Joy said and Julian said, you're you're not just a number or statistic. You are a story. Very inspiring words, and I love that quote from Julian. And I think it's it's so important because there are so many misconceptions about. What exactly is affirmative action? What exactly does it mean to be race conscious? So I have one more prepared question, and I think we might actually be able to get into audience Q&A a little bit early. But um, as we talk about how it's so important to amplify the amazing work y'all are doing and am amplifying your voices because you are the experts, um, as a coalition, you have had the opportunity to work with various organizations that amplify students' voices on this issue. Um, how important has it been to have your voice heard in these spaces? Um, I can kick this off. So I know Maya was kind of talking about this in the last panel, and I think it's frustrating when students aren't considered as stakeholders because we are the people that are being impacted by these policies, and when organizations aren't talking to students, how do you really know what your policies are doing and how you don't, like if you don't understand the people that you're trying to help, then you're not really going to craft good legislation or good research that genuinely impacts the lives of students. And that's why it's so important to make sure you are uplifting student stories and you are providing funding and committing to events like these where student voices can genuinely be heard because we are fighting a really tough fight, and I, we actually had an interview this morning, um, and I was talking about this, but I think our generation faces just so many crises that have kind of been passed down to us. Like, we're tackling the reproductive rights movement, and we're tackling climate change, and we're tackling all of these different social barriers, and for, for our generation to be working this hard and not being listened to is extremely frustrating. And that's why I think it's really great that we're able to be here and that we're having Gen Z members elected to Congress and having young people um, kind of at the forefront of this activism movement because we are being impacted by, this, by these education policies and we are being impacted by just so many different crises and it's kind of, I think it's really great that we are kind of helping to shape um, the policies that are affecting us and the people that are younger than us. Yeah, and just to add on really quickly, <laughs> um, I think I was talking to Deshaun when I first got here on Sunday afternoon, um, but uh, I think something was brought up about just like, because when we were at school in the fall, and it was just the four of us when we first started, we were putting like a good 30 hours into this every week, uh, like up to 50 hours sometimes. We'd wake up in like the middle of the night, respond to an email, go back to sleep, get up the next morning at like 7 a.m. to go to our like 8 a.m. classes. And it's, it's a lot for student organizers, but because of how important it is and because it's going to impact people who come after us, we continue to like strive forward because if we stop, then it's a lot of work that just doesn't get done. And so, yeah, I think with that, we, um, yeah, we really want to emphasize on that. And then I think Adela wanted to say something. Oh, no, yeah, I was just gonna kind of pivot a little bit. I absolutely agree with Sarah and Joy and Echo, um, their points, but I was going to mention that like from 
a coalition side, a lot of our objective is to educate others, and especially other students, especially since UNC as a student body wasn't really even aware of the case up until like the actual decision day that it was overturned. So being able to work with organizations that are able to share our work with others and have other students across the nation um, learn about this as well and have like maybe even become inspired or like have their own ideas about affirmative action has been really amazing and really great for us as well. And we are so grateful to be able to listen and learn from you because as has been said multiple times, like y'all are the experts, y'all are on the front lines and the work y'all are doing is absolutely incredible. So we are so appreciative as an organization and as a policy space. Um, but I do think that is actually all I have. So I will turn it over to Q&A from the audience. Um, anybody in here, we again have the mic to pass around and we are also taking questions online, so. All right, this comes, this is an anonymous question that we got from someone online um, that wants to know this case was cynically designed to pit the interests of some students of color against other students of color. Um, so how has this dynamic sort of affected your advocacy on campus and how you handled the case and moving forward? Uh, well, to start off, UNC's case wasn't like Harvard's case where they used Asian American students against like black and brown students. Um, and it was really funny because me and Sarah, when uh, we were like talking, we were like, isn't it hilarious that the four of us like started this not knowing what Harvard's case was like at all. And so like, we like, we all just got together and we were like, this is crazy. Cause like now our, as our team has expanded and we have had others join us, um, it's also like, the four of us, like the majority of our coalition is Asian women. And so I think we also come to realize that we don't speak for a good portion of people on campus. And so that's why we were so hellbent on trying to unify as many cultural organizations on campus and try and get them to speak because we don't have the experiences. We have the experiences of Asian women and it's, it's great that all four of us can share that because uh, with our similar backgrounds, we still have very different stories. Like all four of us went to go into different work when we like graduate and everything. And so, um, yeah, we want to uplift voices by unifying and like creating this big movement um, or this big wave um, of like change. And I also really want to um, talk about how like the Asian American community is not a monolith. We're all put together. Like Asia is like most of the world. So to combine a whole group of people and be like, this is your experience. That's kind of crazy to me. So I'm, I think that like, I think we need to push back this past this narrative of like Asian Americans are, you know, discriminated um, in the, for, um, in the process of, um, of college admissions, I know personally that we've all talked about how we've all shared our um, Asian identity in our um, college admission, and it does impact, positively impacted why we're at UNC. I can see for myself, my test scores and my um, GPA doesn't match the out-of-student um, like standard, but I still, uh, but when I reviewed my college admission and why they admitted me, they were like, well, the activism you did in the Asian American community uh, is we love that and we hope you can bring something like that here. And so my background played a huge role and um, bringing back the idea like we aren't numbers, like I'm not just uh, like my SAT score, I have other things to bring as well as um, a lot of other students. And I hope that if Asian American students are listening, it's a call to action that we have to not continue this, this myth because it's hurting our community and it's disappointing to see how our group is used as a uh, political wedge and some people are playing into it to put down other racial groups. We have a question over here. <laughs> um, first, I just want to say it's really cool that you guys are here today. I've never been to a, um, an event where students were speaking, so this is really cool. Um, I was just wondering, so Obviously, the affirmative action case um, was and continues to be a super controversial issue, hence why the court decided to announce it at the very end um, of their term. Um, so anyways, I was wondering, 
about starting the coalition? What were maybe some challenges that you faced um, starting something that had this super controversial undertone to it? Yeah. I honestly don't even think we thought about that. Like I, <laughs> like when I first heard about the affirmative action case, my first thought was number one, what can I do to get involved? And then when I realized that there was no infrastructure on campus to fight for affirmative action, okay, how am I going to start this? And I don't think we thought about the controversy until we started tabling and like students would come us come to us and complain and be like, why are you doing this? Like, oh my gosh. But before that, we, I think we all kind of just like jumped in head first because it was the right thing to do. And that's really it. <laughs> like, I think we face challenges of um, solidarity on campus. And I think that's something that's really frustrating to me is that solidarity has kind of been at an all time low. And I think that our, like, especially here as Asian women, like Joy was saying, I can't speak for the experiences that I haven't lived. And to me, that means I need to reach out to communities with different identities than the ones that I have. And it was difficult to talk to students and encourage them to work together um, just because we kind of wanted to create something that encompassed the entire Carolina community and there were groups that wanted to focus on their own identities. And honestly, I learned that that's totally okay. Like, we will try to diversify our own group and work to advocate on behalf of students that we know and the students that we are, but at the same time, we can't speak for everyone on campus. And that's been a really tough lesson for me to learn, <laughs> um, but I think that's probably, probably was our biggest challenge in the beginning. We also didn't really get like hate comments in the beginning because we were just so small and like nobody cared. Um, and, and then after the case results dropped, everyone started like, okay, like Christina was talking about this, but we got so many DMs that were like, this is wrong, this is awful. And we were like, we don't really want to respond to you. And, it's like, um, and then we got tagged and they were calling us racist, but like, and then making like really racist comments towards us. So it was really crazy. I mean, like, I think it was just hectic afterwards. Like when we first started, we were like, oh, this, is, this isn't bad. Like I, I thought we were gonna get a bigger reaction, but we didn't till much, much later. So I think the consequences came, like, we're not consequence, but, um, just like the negative sides of like the media didn't come till way later. And I think we're all so grateful for that because that would have been really crazy to deal with. Could I pivot the, yeah. a little bit? I think another thing that really like, um, I kind of Adela about this up, but it's like taking care of your mental health because this is a lot of work. Like we're students, we're here to learn, not to fight to learn. Like, um, and it's so important that we know that it's the institution's responsibility that they should have these things already here. Um, and it's not responsibly students to constantly be like, hey, we need this, we need this. And I think, especially when students of color and um, like men talking about mental health and how um, my friend, Divya Aikut, uh, she was doing this study um, and she found that it was about like how a lot of the women's health and specifically with like stress and how a lot of um, Women of color, particularly uh, black women, accelerate and age faster than their white counterpart because they have to take on this stress of being community builders and taking on you know, all this work of racial trauma and um, this gendered identity. So I think the, the best way they found to kind of um, get past that uh, or try to kind of ameliorate the kind of consequences is through community. And so I am so grateful to work with such lovely women. Um, and we do things that are also not just affirmative action, it's community building, finding a sense of like belonging with um, amongst other students. And there are some days where you're gonna come out of meetings and you're gonna be like, oh, that was awful. Like, I feel like I'm screaming into the abyss and no one's listening. Um, but like you have a place on campus and you, there are gonna be days where you're gonna move forward and there's gonna be some days where you're just like, I can't, there's not gonna move forward and that's okay. There's some days, weeks where you're just like, I'm not gonna do anything. And that's okay, because I feel like it's such a work mindset of like, you have to keep pushing, but it's okay um, because a lot of institutions try to wait out their students. They wait for the four years and they're like, you're gone. The demands are gone. Um, and so I hope that students don't feel like this is their only, like this is their entire responsibility. It's the institutions too. I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. We'll go right there. 
First and foremost, thank you so much for coming out and talking with us. Um, I learned a lot from this panel. Given the number of months that you spent working on this project, um, I'm interested in hearing about if there were any direct lines of communication between the coalition as well as the administration and faculty at your school, and if so, what was their response like? I think we spent like a solid month trying to find an advisor. So we talked to at least like eight different faculty members. Um, and then we talked to like the Dean of the Undergraduates uh, Arts and Science, I think that's what it's called. Um, and she kind of was just like, she's, she was like very supportive for us. Um, I like most of the professors were like, I would love to help you, but I don't know how to help you. And so a lot of it was like working together to figure stuff out. And me and Christina spoke to like a professor um, group on campus called Slate. And I don't know if they're technically tied to UNC, but they're all UNC faculty. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, a lot of our faculty have been very supportive, but I think Christina knows more about this than I do, but a lot of them have been prevented from talking about affirmative action and having like, um, responses to it, but if you want to emphasize more on that. Oh, yeah, so I think the faculty on campus have been really helpful, but recently I think UNC banned some compelled speech, so it's very limited of what professors and in certain institution, institutional organizations can say, um, and it's very difficult because no one really knows what to do because this is very murky water, um, but I think trying to outreach has been very helpful and, you know, like doing things like educational summits and working with our advisor um, and trying to find what resources are available on campus has been helpful. Thanks again for, for speaking today. I'm, I'm curious about sort of your plans moving forward. You know, it sounds like you started this last fall. You've had sort of two semesters. The case was pending. Now there's been a decision. I think most of you are class of 25 or 26, so you have two or three more years on campus. You know, by the time you're graduating in May 2025 or 2026, what do you hope this group has accomplished um, come that date? Yeah, uh, that is a great question. So I think something that is really important that we're trying to emphasize right now is to not let this movement of activism, this wave of activism across our student body die out. Like already it's kind of started to mellow, which is really sad. But um, once we get back on campus, like we want to be as active as possible and, you know, continue to remind people that we're here and that we're here for them. We're here for diversity. We're here on campus. Um, so we are planning on hosting an educational summit and we are we're able to get in contact with a lot more cultural groups and a lot of other student organizations on our campuses. So collaborating with them and continuing to get their ideas and their input on our events as well. And um, continuing to just make sure that people don't become apathetic towards this situation. Uh, and I know we've also talked about wanting to expand past UNC um, into broader areas such as the North Carolina Research Triangle, which includes larger universities like Duke and NC State, and then even going beyond that to working with um, schools nationally like Harvard, which we've already have some connections with, and other um, schools across the US. If you have one more, then I think we can. If not, I'll pass it over to Deshaun, maybe. Yeah. For, okay. This is actually the perfect closing question from somebody online, but they have said, you all have been working so hard and are continuing to do so this summer. So what's bringing you all joy right now? <laughs> oh, joy. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... My team, I think, just I'll start, but I think mostly our team, and we have three missing members currently, but them back in, uh, two of them back in North Carolina and one of them abroad, uh, we were scattered this summer. Like, two of us were abroad, Sarah was here in D.C., some of us were in other states, so um, being able to, like, come together every two-ish weeks to like meet and talk and still have the same energy as if we'd been meeting in person, um, we're just... We're hopeful, but we're also really realistic and like very hard on ourselves. And that's what I feel like keeps motivating and pushing us. And so I have to say like, yeah, definitely my team and the support that we all have for each other. 
<laughs> That's it? <laughs> I'd probably say, like, <laughs> I'd probably say being able to do this work, and I have realized that I'm a very privileged person to be able to do activism. And I grew up in a community and with a family that would let me go out and protest. And for instance, last summer um, after Roe v. Wade was overturned, I went out and protest every single day for four weeks. And that's just not like a luxury that most people have. Like most people have to work or have to go to school. And to be able to commit to this work and genuinely often not get paid to be involved in activism is something that I'm very grateful for. And I guess like, I find a lot of joy in this work. Like it's definitely hard, but like because I'm able to follow my passions, that's something that I'm really lucky, lucky to do. That's a really great answer. So I kind of don't want to follow up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say community for me as well, which is like part of the reason why we're all here fighting for affirmative action is trying to make sure that students have that kind of community on their campuses. I feel like I, I would just repeat everything that everyone said, so, yeah. <laughs> awesome, thank you all so much. It was such a pleasure being able to speak with all of you. <laughs> I'll pass it over to Deshaun. I actually didn't prepare any closing remarks, but I do want to, <laughs> I was like, oh, wait, I thought we were going to probably go over time. But um, I want to say thank you to all those that did come out and those who tuned in online. Um, thank you for submitting questions and having this dialogue with us. I do want to thank um, the previous panelists that were on the, on the panel with me. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and words. And I also want to say thank you to you all. Y'all are doing wonderful and amazing work. And you've probably heard me say this before. Please take the time to self-care. Like, y'all are doing wonderful work, but I do not want y'all to burn out. Um, but thank you again for everyone for joining in and continue to do this work and fight the fight because, again, we have a lot of things that need to be fixed.